Hi everyone and welcome to today's session as part of the RTS Futures Virtual Careers Fair. With thank you to our headline sponsor NFTS and our bronze sponsor IMG Studios. This afternoon's panel session I hope you will find interesting and insightful but most of all inspiring and fun. As the description of the webinar promises, we'll be focusing on how to get your foot in the door in the world of TV and how a scheme might be able to help. I'm Daniel Morrissey and I head up the Editorial Early Career Schemes at the BBC. That's apprenticeships and trainee programmes in journalism, content production and production management. At the BBC, we also run schemes in broadcast engineering, IT and technology and corporate programmes. It's therefore a topic both close to my heart and one with which I'm very familiar. Joining me is what I'm going to refer to as the Fantastic Five. They're all working in telly and have navigated their way into the industry by making the most of the various access schemes on offer. We've got Lauren, she's been working in TV for just under two years after securing a place on the Mummy Youth Project training scheme. There's Levi, who's recently graduated from the BBC's Journalism Apprenticeship Scheme. Nikki, who made the most of the Channel 4 Broadcast Apprenticeship Scheme. Om Kathum, currently working on a movie, very exciting, after completing UK TV's All Voices scheme, which she secured through Film London's Equal Access Network. And last but not least, Toby Winson, a Media Trust Breaking Into News Award winner. I'm going to hand over to them now to give you a flavour of what they were doing before they worked in TV, how they found their way onto a scheme and what the scheme did for them, and life since finishing the scheme. Right, so let's uh, kick off with you, Toby. So you won the Media Trust Breaking Into News Scheme, but do you want to tell us a bit about what you were doing before that? Yeah, there's only really one way to start. Um, I'm a recovering alcoholic. I am nearly five years sober now. Um, I had liver disease at the age of 25. I spent months in rehab. I destroyed my family and I, I've hit rock bottom. And that actually, when I made the step into journalism where I work now, I was a labourer on a business site. But I blogged about my recovery, about my recovery from alcoholism, and that's where I discovered my passion for writing. And then I didn't really know what I wanted to do next with that passion, but my mum saw, she'd seen my writing, saw that I was half decent, and saw an adver advertisement on ITV News for a competition called Breaking Into News, which was, um, competition to find diverse broadcasters of the future from oh, people from diverse backgrounds broadcasters of the future um and you had to to enter you had to enter with a story idea of your own so my my, my idea was something i'm passionate about and it's alcohol education in schools so I, I planned a story i wrote it i filled in the details about myself and my recovery i sent it off and i was picked as a finalist and um i ended up winning it well, well done, Toby. So having won your place on the scheme, what, what did that offer you? So there was 10 finalists, one for each region. I'm from the southeast of England, so I, I was a finalist for Meridian. Um, you was paired with a journalist and basically you got to bring your story idea to life and actually make it with, with a real camera operator and with the help of Meridian and a journalist. And if it was good enough, it was aired on TV. Um, I was lucky, lucky enough to have mine aired on TV. You also got to go and see how a newsroom operates. So I spent time in a newsroom. I got to travel to Leeds to ITV Calendar where Emmerdale's filmed. Got to see all the studios at Emmerdale. Um, and and they, you really just got immersed into it and shown what, what it would be like to be a broadcast journalist. And also the, the biggest thing I got out of it was the connections and the opportunity to show that what I could do. So where did the interest in working in broadcasting come from? Um, like I said, from my blog, I discovered a passion for writing mm. and telling stories. Um, and in the competition, I, I just sort of applied off the cuff because I, I saw, I don't know, I just thought, do you know what, I'm just, I'm just going to, any opportunity that comes my way, I'm going I'm to go for now. So I went for it. And then when I got a taste of life in a newsroom and met reporters and, and saw, saw what they were doing for what they call work, which is a work I now know, it's great, it's fun. Um, I just ripped full. This, if I could do this for a living, uh, I'm laughing. So that's where the passion came. And the, the more the more time I spent in the new, the more time I spent working on my story, the more time I spent uh, filming my story, and just in that world of broadcast journalism, 
the more I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do for a career. So thanks to mum for spotting the uh, competition. Indeed, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you were telling me about how the blogging both helped with your recovery and getting over what had happened before, but also led you to this, this passion. How did you start the blog? Well, I, I lost seven years of my life to alcoholism. Um, very nearly killed me on a number of I should be dead, really. But I got, I got sober. I was two years sober. It took two years for my head to sort itself out because of all the emotions I've been blocking with alcohol. Um, and, then, and then the last thing was I was beating myself up for losing seven years, my 20s, from 19 to 26. I lost those years to alcoholism and I didn't want them to count for, for nothing. So I thought if I write a blog about my recovery, about what I do to stay sober and the mistakes I've made, if it helps one person not go down the path I went down, then those years will count for something. And it's done that. And it's also landed me a career in broadcast journalism, which I could never have dreamt of before. So, it's, it, yeah. And that's just, that's, that was from taking the plunge, thinking about doing something, thinking about it, and then just, just, just doing it. And that's what I do now. If I ever get an opportunity, I'll just take it and do it. You never know where it's going to lead. You said that um, the scheme gave you contacts that you, you wouldn't have had before. What else did the scheme give you? Well, the, the biggest thing was contacts. The second, no, I'd say the two biggest things were the contacts and the chance to show people in a newsroom what I could do. So, so I can't emphasize enough. If you get the opportunity to go on work experience, the most important thing is that you show them that you can be valuable. So, so you might end up making an idiot out of yourself, but what have you got to lose? That was my, my, my thinking anyway. So if I heard them talking about a story and they needed a case study, or they, needed, they needed a location or something, I would, I would start looking and start throwing ideas to them. And then you need to leave a work experience placement with them thinking, oh, we need someone for this. Who, who could we get? Oh, what about that person who was here the other day? You have to leave an impression. The other thing is, before you leave work experience, make sure that you say to whoever you've been working with, what do I do, need to do next? What do I need to do next to get here and get paid work? And, and if you've made a good impression, they'll tell you, they'll give you a next step. Just never leave empty handed. Top tips. So never leave empty handed, um, maximising those contacts that you were making whilst you were on the work placement. And Toby, what, what happened at the end of the scheme? You know, what's the journey from there to where you are now? Through, through the scheme, I got contacts. Through the contacts, I got work experience at ITV Meridian and ITV Calendar. Through work experience, I showed them what I could do and I pushed them and said, look, what do I need to do next? And they offered me more work experience at ITV Calendar. By the way, for that work experience, I booked a hotel. I live in Kent. I booked a hotel in Leeds, traveled to Leeds, took time off work, stayed in a hotel, did the work experience. To, so you have to show commitment. Like it, It's not easy. That, that's the thing, because you've got so much competition. But if you do show the commitment, you will get it. So... Um, and then the election came along and that was my opportunity. They needed someone to phone bash for the general election in 2019. So they offered me a two month contract from the impression I gave, I guess, um, and, and the effort that I put in. And I haven't looked back since. I've, since then I went on to another two month contract at Calendar. Then I was furloughed because of coronavirus for five months. Uh, and then I was asked to come to ITV Meridian for a six week contract to help them because they were in need. And now I'm full time at ITV Meridian. I'm staff. So, in less than two years, it's it's been an incredible journey, and I'm very very grateful. But a lot of hard work. Well done. It's it sounds like you you've made a fantastic start to your career. And do you hear any, anything more from the the people that run the scheme? Have they stayed in touch with you? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Media Trust, the ones who got in touch with me about this today. I've also had the opportunity to give a talk about my story of my journey of alcoholism and into broadcast media at Facebook's headquarters in London, um, in front of top media professionals. Um, they're always, uh, I'm on another scheme as well with Media Trust at the moment, uh, the Screen Skills Mentoring Scheme. So I have a brilliant mentor called Caroline O'Neill, who's, who's, who's helping me, she's teaching me how to make treatments for documentaries. So, yeah, it's just been non-stop and Media Trust, I can't praise them enough and thank them enough. Without them and breaking into news, I wouldn't have got the contacts that 
have basically got me here. Contacts, um, schemes will get you contacts, contacts will eventually get you jobs. Top tip. What's been the most exciting piece of work that you've been involved in, in since becoming a journalist? Exciting, daunting, it's got to be COVID. Um, since I've joined Meridian, that, so this is, Meridian's in the southeast of England for anyone who doesn't know. And we've kind of been in the centre of COVID the last few months. So since I've been here with, with the, the, the Kent uh, strain, uh, since I've been here, it's, it's, been, it's been a privilege to, to, to report on COVID. Basically, what I do in my job at the moment is I produce the lunchtime news bulletin pretty much every, every day. I have also plan as well. I, I do a bit of everything. I interview people, I find stories. So every day I've been re, re, uh, producing lunchtime bulletins reporting on COVID in, in Kent and Sussex. And it's, it's been, it's been life changing really. But um, on top of that, the election, I, I help report on a general election. I set up constituency profiles, which is, sounds a bit complicated, but it's basically finding interesting places in interesting political parts of a news region's patch. But that was fun. I went to a, um, I went to the Doncaster general election count. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been a whirlwind. It certainly sounds like it. Do, do you know if the scheme's running this year, Media Trust Broken Into News? I, I actually don't. It, it, what didn't, so I was the last winner of it. Last year, there wasn't one because of COVID. I don't know about this year. Okay. But, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that they'll be running it again. Well, look, uh, all of our speakers today are, are truly inspiring, but thank you uh, so much for the generosity you've shown, Toby, in, in sharing your story and where it got us to, got you to today. Thank you ever so much. Um, let's move on to uh, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Hello. I'm really well, thank you. Good, good. Nice to see you. So I know you were on the Mama Youth Project, um, which we can talk about in a moment, but tell us a bit about what you were doing before you came to that. So before I found the Mummy Youth Project, um, I'll scroll back about 10 years or so. Um, so I was quite lucky in that I knew I wanted to work in television from quite a young age. I was sort of in my early teens um, and I was lucky enough to get a placement um, on an ITV Inspire work experience course, which um, similar to Toby, actually, my mum found it. And I think when you're 16, and your school tells you that you have to do two weeks of work experience, you're like, oh my God, why? Why do I have to do this? Um, but I applied for that and was successful. Um, and I'd spent a lot of time dancing. I'd been on stage quite a lot when I was younger. Um, and I always had a feeling that's quite difficult to describe, I think, um, just before a show would start. And I'd be standing in the wings, waiting to go on. And I had this kind of flutter in my chest. And it was like I was part of something and about to do something that people were going to enjoy. And I had that exact same feeling when I walked into the foyer of the ITV building. Um, and that's kind of confirmed for me that I knew television was the career path I wanted to pursue. Um, so I went through school, was had it in my mind the whole time, was constantly thinking of ways that I could try and um, get some extracurricular experience that might be helpful for me. Um, and eventually I went to university. Um, I actually didn't decide to do a degree in media or film studies or anything like that. Instead, I went for a language degree. So I studied French and Spanish for four years. Um, and I think that was one of the best decisions I ever made actually, because not only am I now, I'll never say fluent because there are always more words to learn, um, but now I can speak two languages. And I had a lot of life experience as well, which I think was really important um, in just kind of being able to manage what was going to come next and trying to find myself an actual job in television. Um, so once I finished uh, university, I started working part time in Waitrose. And um, the way I describe it to people is Waitrose was one job and then finding a job in television was my other part time job. So. You then came across the, the Mama Youth Project. Was that, that was during this job hunting phase? Yeah, so um, I was trawling the, um, the internet every single day. I had all sorts of TV job finding websites um, lined up, saved to my browser history. Um, I was looking at them every single day, refreshing the job pages, looking for new things that were coming out and applying as soon as I could. 
And one of these was the Facebook group, people um, who want to work in television. And it was the runners one. And I saw this bright red digital flyer um, with the Mummy Youth Project logo on it and um, clicked on it, had a little read. Um, they were really, really comprehensive in the description of what the scheme was, what it offered you um, and the application process as well, which was quite lengthy. Um, so I saved all the forms to my computer um, and over a couple of days filled them out um, and I applied. So I know it's a, a project that, based in London, isn't it? And it's run by the fabulous Bob Clark. So yes. tell us a bit about that interview process. I remember you telling us uh, it was a little bit daunting at first. It was, yeah. So um, I had quite a stroke of luck because initially my written application was um, rejected. So they'd sent me an email to say, thank you very much for applying, but we're not going to progress your application any further, um, which was very upsetting. But at the time, it was kind of another one in a string of either no replies or a string of rejections. Um, so I kind of thought, OK, it's sad, but we'll move on. Um, and someone somewhere must have been looking down on me because um, I got a, an email saying they'd had a cancellation for one of their interviews and that they'd like me to come in. So obviously, um, I jumped at the chance, called up, booked in my interview. Um, and my interview actually was with Bob. Um, and his wife, Caroline, who also works at Mummy Youth, um, which was quite daunting because obviously he's the head honcho. Um, and it's not only was I very conscious that my written application um, had fallen slightly short of the mark, but um, I wanted to try. And obviously you want to try and impress somebody when you're going for an interview. Um, and Bob is, he's such a character. It was difficult to, it's always difficult to get a sense of who somebody is before you meet them in person. Um, but I had done my research. I'd listened to interviews that he'd done before because he has done an amazing thing in setting up Mummy Youth. He has a real story. And so um, he's gained quite a lot of traction um, with various people wanting to interview him. So I watched and read lots of interviews, tried to find out as much as possible about not only his history, but the history of the project. Um, and went into the interview and we ended up, I think it was about an hour we ended up talking for. Um, it was a smattering of the sort of interview questions you'd normally expect and then general chit chat as well, which was really lovely because it made me feel so comfortable and at ease. And that is not something that I normally associate with an interview scenario, to be honest. Um, so I had the first interview and then we moved on. I was at the end of that interview um, they told me that he didn't have to think about it and he wanted me to go straight through to the group interview, which was obviously very exciting. Um, and this second round was a group of about 14 of us, I think, all wanting to go for four roles in um, production management. Um, and there were lots of activities, lots of tasks we had to do that day, quite a range of things. Um, and then at the end of that one, I got a phone call saying that I'd been successful. So. Well done. <laughs> Folks, do keep bringing the questions in in the Q&A box at the bottom. In fact, I've got one question here, which was just right for you, Lauren. Um, someone's asking me about group assessments, as they often feature as part of the recruitment process for schemes. So what did you actually do on that group assessment and what do you think made you stand out? So um, the group assessment, I think, is the perfect opportunity for employers to see how you work with other people um, who you're going to work with throughout the scheme and these things especially the mummy youth project I mean it's run the only way I can describe it is like television boot camp um, it's you have such tight deadlines you have so much to fit in and at the end of the day you're making an actual um, television show for broadcast um, so in the group assessment, they want to see how you're going to work with your other potential teammates. They want to see what kind of role you naturally step into, whether or not you are naturally a leader. Um, and with that, whether you can listen to other people, take on feedback and other people's ideas and kind of form solutions um, in a short space of time. Um, and I think for me, what I'd like to think made me stand out was that I really made an effort to take an interest not only in 
um, what people were saying on the day, but also ask them questions about themselves and learn a bit about who these people were. Um, and that was something that actually paid off because Bob, towards the end of our group assessment, um, said, Lauren, can you tell me something about Mimi, who was somebody else who had been um, in that assessment with me? And had I not taken the time to speak to her and ask her um, questions about herself and try and remember things, genuinely take an interest, I wouldn't have had anything to say. And I would have looked a bit of a mug, to be honest. But I think I like to think that that's something that made me stand out. And you then got on to the Mummy Youth Project. You said it's like a, a TV boot camp. So what did you actually do? Um, so it is a very intense 14 weeks. The first four weeks are dedicated to training. Um, so in Mummy Youth, it's quite unique in that you make a television programme which broadcasts on um, Sky One. It's a seven episode show. Um, and everybody who makes the show, aside from um, a small team of executive, so an exec pro producer, producer and two assistant producers are trainees. So all of the cameras, all of the sound, all of the editors, all of the production team and all of the researchers are all trainees. Um, and for a lot of people, it's their first experience of working in television. So um, it is very, very hands on. They kind of for me, I was the trainee production manager and they said to me, here you go. Here's a budget. This is your team. Make this TV show. And we are very well supported by other production companies. They get production management staff in to help with things like cost monitors and the very technical um, aspect of everything. Um, but you do end up working long hours. You've got a really high amount of content to not only shoot, but also to edit um, and deliver within that 10 weeks after you've had your four weeks training. So it's a very intense one. It's an amazing scheme. Brilliant to hear. Someone's asking which um, Mummy Youth project did you take part in? I about two years ago, was it? Three years ago? Yeah, so I was March 2019 was my intake. So what's happened since then and where you are now? Well, since then, it's been an absolute dream come true, to be honest with you. I've been there. I feel very fortunate um, to have worked on the shows that I've worked on. Um, part of the scheme, um, as part of the scheme, they offer you a six week placement at the end. And I was really lucky in getting a placement at the BBC on a Children in Need documentary. Um, so I did six weeks on that based at Television Centre um, out in uh, West 12. And I made the most of that opportunity. Like Toby was saying, you go in for a short period of time and you want to make the most of it. So I really tried to make some good contacts um, worked as hard as I could. And I met some talent managers there who worked for the BBC, um, who passed my CV on after I had a chat with them. And I worked on the one show for almost a year and a half now. So that took me right up until August 2020. Um, and I was so lucky that I was there when the pandemic all started kicking off because it meant that I had quite stable employment and I was, I feel really lucky, um, really, really lucky to have been there for that. Um, whilst at the one show, I had a range of experience. So I worked with the studio team, with the VT team, um, really getting a good grip of how a television show, which is such a machine and kind of a BBC flagship show comes together. Um, and since then I've worked on Strictly Come Dancing. I'm currently on Morning Live. Um, and I'm off to a new commission for my next job, which starts mid-February. So very exciting stuff. So exciting. Well done. That's really great to hear. I'm going to move on to Nikki. So oh, yeah. you were on the channel for Broadcast Production Apprenticeship, weren't you? But you were doing something quite different before all of that. So fill us yeah. in what, where you were before. So I went to the Brit School and I studied theatre and makeup for four years. And I was just doing um, script writing, a bit of media. So I was still doing my GCSEs and um, BTEC. So I didn't do A-levels. And then I think it got to the end where we were about to, you know, apply for universities and stuff. And I was thinking to myself that I didn't want to go to uni, nor did I want to go to drama school. And I was like, well, what is in the middle? And that's when I discovered apprenticeships and um, placements. So I left college with no idea what I was going to do. And I was working in the House of Commons for like a couple of months. And then my best friends and I were like, we should start looking at schemes now, you know, like you want to get back into just working again just something that we actually enjoy and 
um, we what we did, we researched broadcasters, so BBC, Channel 4, ITV, and even like radio channels, and looked at what schemes they were offering. And I remember coming across Channel 4 broadcast production scheme, and I was like, this is what I want to do. Um, it was offering a 14-month contract with a production company, and you would be learning anything from editorial, um, researching, everything to do with TV, and you'll be the apprentice. So as well as um, working for the production company, Channel 4 would also take you in, I think, every two months and train for two weeks. So we'll go in every two months for two weeks and learn about budgeting, editing, um, filming, everything. So that's what I did. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm not going to get it. Like, it's, it's, it's impossible. I think, like, 10,000 people applied for it. And they, I got it. <laughs> so it was, it was, like... I was honestly so shocked and I feel like what definitely helped me getting onto this scheme was throughout college and in my gap year I worked on so many different things like my blogging photography um writing anything I could think of just to one out of fun and then two just help me in the future mm-hmm. and I feel like those things definitely paid off and helped me got my place on the scheme. So let's just step back a moment. I'm I'm incredibly passionate about apprenticeships. I think they're a fantastic way into the industry. Yeah. But what what was it about apprenticeships that appealed to you? It was the fact that I would be able to work and learn. And I feel like over university is so no bash in it, but it's restrictive in a sense where you learn, but the experience side isn't always there. And especially if you want to get into TV, they do value experience. So I want something I can do where I can literally gain experience, basically. And, yeah, so that was basically it. And that's what I wanted to do, an apprenticeship. And it was, like, the best, the honestly, the best one I could do. I've got a question for you, Nikki, from Jamie Stevenson. She says that she's been to events, um, uh, including with Channel 4, and, and got emails about events. But she's at college right now, so she's finding it hard to... Um, get the time to go to any of them. Have you got any advice to her on how she could maintain that connection? To be fair, I feel like they are, if you email them again, they're quite understanding and they do, um, they do appreciate young people. So if you do tell them that you do have other commitments, they can try to offer you something else. So like, they're very open. They literally understand like people still have universities and college work. So even if you can't make events, you can still email them and even send a CV and even ask work experience, like still keep a connection just because you're working or doing something else doesn't mean, you know, they're going to cancel you out completely. So I hope that helps. (laughs) (laughs) So you spoke about you you wanted a a job and obviously working on the job is at the very heart of uh, an apprenticeship scheme, but there's also an academic side and studying exams, isn't there? Tell me a bit about that. Well, um, so as well as working, I also had deadlines at the same time. So I was working nine to six, Monday to Friday, and I would have deadlines for my actual apprenticeship course in like three weeks. And it was very hard. However, what was amazing about the apprenticeship, because they do know you are apprentice, they sometimes do give you allocated time and they are so understanding because you are the apprentice, like make the most of it. So there was not a lot of pressure on me. It was still, you know, I still um, had to meet my deadlines, but I know I was feeling a bit overwhelmed. I could go to my mentor and say, hey, um, I can't do this right now. It's okay if I can just focus on my work and basically balance it. Like no one's going to be angry at you. Like they understand you're an apprentice. Like it's all good. So when when did you finish the scheme? 2019. Yes, 2019. Mm. So what came next? Well, Corona came, unfortunately. (laughs) But um, um, I got into um, casting, which I'm really excited about. So I'm now a junior casting researcher. And my latest show I worked on was Celebs Go Dating. And that came out, I think, three weeks ago. So it's it's really fun at the moment. So, yeah, I want to go down the casting route. And I feel like I was able to do that through the apprenticeship 100%. And I feel like what was the best thing about the apprenticeship I was on is that it was for 14 months I had so much time to just take in everything and do all these different experiences and work with other companies so because where I was working 
Nexton was an umbrella company. So next door, and like on other floors, there were like other companies, for example, like um, Remarkable, um, Cut and Mustard, and Initial TV, who make Big Brother. And what I did, I asked my mentor, hey, um, now there's some downtime, am I allowed to go to these other companies? So because she was a managing director and she's been there for over, I think, 10 years, she put me in contact and that was honestly the best thing. So I went and worked with other companies as well and I was still working at the same time. It was just, it was honestly so amazing, so amazing. I've got a message here from Juliet. Uh, she says, I can't believe people know what they want to do when they're so young. I knew nothing of that age. But <laughs> is that true? Did you, know, did you know anything about casting, the work of casting before you I got to it? Yeah, I didn't know anything. All I knew, trust me, I didn't know, know anything. You know, nothing about TV at all. All I knew was that I wanted, I liked writing. And I was funny at writing some sort short scripts. That was it. I had no idea what casting even was anything to do with TV. So mm. don't feel like you need to have um, an understanding because as an apprentice, they do want you to come in with a lack of knowledge. As long as you have passion for anything to do with anything creative, that is what they want to see. Because I, like I said, I had nothing, no idea about TV, nothing. And I know Toby, for example, you were doing business and economics right at the start, weren't you? It was really through the blogging that you discovered this love of writing. Yeah. If I'm perfectly honest, my degree isn't a complete waste of money for me, but it's just the way that my life's panned out. I've never used my degree ever. And to be honest, I don't know how I got that because I was an alcoholic at the time. But yeah, it's just, it's funny how things work out. But if I, if I can make it, anyone can, trust me. <laughs> Nikki, what what um what does the scheme give you since now you're working do they keep in touch is there sort of like an alumni connection yeah so um channel four are always keeping in contact with us and um obviously because of corona now but before they invite us to like events and stuff um what we're doing if we need any advice or anything like it's like a family there and Part of the apprenticeship was run by Think Bigger and they are like, a, they control more of the education side. So they will always contact me and ask me what I'm doing and just help with anything to do with TV really, if I need a connection or just anything, even like a chat about, if I'm stressed about something, like they're honestly amazing. And when we were chatting before, you, you were telling me about how you're, you're really passionate about making a difference in the industry. Yeah. Can you talk a bit about that. Well, obviously, so um, the TV industry, as we know, is now becoming more diverse, but it wasn't as diverse a couple of years ago. And it is, it's quite a difficult topic to approach, especially because I'm so young, I'm 21. But um, when I'm talking to, you know, higher people, it's, it's a conversation that just needs to be had now. And I'm not um, that worried to speak about it especially because most people in the TV industry now are so aware about diversity. So I wanted just to make TV just diverse in production, editorial, on camera, behind camera, just just more inclusive basically. And I try to do that through every task or every project that I'm on. So whether I'm casting or writing or looking for talent, I always try to go the extra mile and be inclusive. And I'm happy that I'm able to do that. And do you think schemes like the one that you've been on and, and everyone else is talking about have helped change the diversity of the industry? A hundred percent. My scheme was honestly amazing. Um, they literally got everyone. So we had um, people who are, um, you know, non-binary, um, Black, Asian, Christian, anywhere from London, Plymouth to Scotland. They um, literally have included everyone. And this honestly such an amazing honestly amazing people with disabilities um just you just anyone really and it's just it's beautiful i love it <laughs> got a nice comment here from juliet hamill who says can't wait to see what nikki makes so oh, there you go that's you. nice <laughs> <laughs> okay levi we're going to move on to you Hello. so you joined the bbc as a, a bbc journalism apprentice where, where were you before 
when I applied for the scheme, I was in sixth form. So finished my GCSEs and then I stayed on at my school for sixth form. And I did um, A-levels in psychology, sociology and ICT. So like I didn't do any media or English or anything like that. Um, and yeah, like Nikki said, I just knew that university was at the path for me. Um, I always, like, I've never really had an interest in going to university. As I said, um, like, if anyone does go to university, that's not a problem or anything, but I just knew it wasn't for me. Um, and the sixth form I went to, it was very directed towards people to go, they, they directed a lot of people towards going to university. They didn't speak about apprenticeships ever. It was all, okay, make sure you're applying for uni guys, all that sort of stuff. And I think I was one of a few people in my year that didn't apply. Like it even got to a, po a point where my, um, head head of year he offered to pay for my uni application like they wanted me to go that badly um, and I just said no I'm not applying I don't want to apply um, so yeah I always know I wanted to do an apprenticeship so I think I googled um, radio apprenticeships or BBC apprenticeships and that's how I found it. So that's interesting so you didn't feel apprenticeships were uh, like featured at your school or as part of your careers advice at all but you knew you wanted to do that so what was it about university that, that didn't appeal? For me similar to Nick, what Nikki said I like the idea of actually getting the experience whilst learning um, so I knew I didn't want to go straight into work by itself I wanted to continue like my education as well um, so for me the thing that attracted it the thing that attracted me to it was, yeah, the idea of getting experience whilst also learning and, and earning at the same time. And to go back to Juliet's point in the chat, she said, where she said, can't believe people know what they want to do when they're so young. So you were Googling um, radio apprenticeships, but did you, did you know that you wanted to write? What, what, what did you think you wanted to do at the time? Um, so, yeah, I, I really didn't really know what I wanted to do. That's why I picked those A-levels. I didn't pick media or English or anything like that. Um, but when I was when I was 16, so I'm 20 now, when I was 16, I um, I just had a, like, people kept telling me, like, I'm so talkative and all sort of things. So I had an idea for, like, doing presenting. So I ended up contacting a local radio station called Represent, and I ended up doing work experience there and volunteering there um, for about a year. And that's how I kind of knew, OK, this is what I want to do. So I guess I knew at the age of like 17, maybe. <laughs> so having done that bit of uh, searching on the Internet, you came across the BBC Journalism Apprenticeship Scheme and yeah. uh, you obviously got a place on it. So what was the scheme all about? What did you do? Um, so when I first applied, you had to fill out an online application, just speaking about yourself and um, why you'd like to get into the scheme. And then after that, when I applied, I didn't think I had a chance at all of getting it. Like I thought, let me just do this, but I don't think I have a chance. Um, and then there was a video interview where we had to just speak about ourselves for 30 seconds about why we'd be good for the scheme. Um, and then after that was a... Um, assessment centre in Birmingham which was like a face-to-face -face interview a group interview and um like a news test and yeah again I didn't when I pr I remember the interview day I was on the train to Birmingham and I went and everyone there was in suits and everyone had all this experience at local newspapers and I was just like oh okay <laughs> and um yeah so since then I got onto the scheme thankfully and yeah, it's been literally the best thing. I would say the best thing I've ever done. Was, was you mentioned group scheme. assessments, and I know because someone particularly asked about it. What was what was in your group assessment? Um, so our group assessment was a scenario. We was given like a news scenario, and we was um, asked to work on how we'd cover that on TV or radio. Um, and yeah, like Lauren said, I just focused. I didn't focus on being like the main character in the group interview. Um, I just made sure I listened to everyone else and got my ideas across without interrupting people and stuff like that. So I would definitely say that's a good tip for group good interviews. Stuff. So you're on the scheme and um, you're working on the job. What was the job? What were you doing? Um, so we were doing part time studying and part time working. So we were at a college in Wolverhampton doing a journalism course um, that consisted of, I think, seven exams, 
and about three coursework units. And then at the same time, we were working at the BBC. So I was at um, a place called BBC Stories that do um, short documentaries and stuff like that. And then I got moved to um, Newsbeat, which is a news programme on Radio 1 and 1 Extra. And yeah, just been there ever since. What are you doing right now? Um, I'm still at Newsbeat right now. Um, I am, yeah, just trying to like do as many things as I can, learn how to do radio as well as writing online. Um, I've recently got a video out yesterday on the vaccine, like just a Q&A video. Um, so, yeah. So how did you balance the, you know, you mentioned seven exams. Uh, I know you were doing a diploma in journalism and you're working. How do you balance all of that? Well, like Nikki said, I was just really open with um, my manager at the work side. If I had um, coursework to do or revision for an exam, I would kind of just, you know, ask, is it all right if I have an hour at the end of the day to revise for this exam? I feel like it's definitely okay to ask because they understand that you are an apprentice. You're not just working there. You are studying as well. So, yeah, for me, I did find the balance quite difficult at the beginning because I didn't realise how much work it would be. Um, but once I got my head over it and stuff, um, yeah, it was, the balance was okay. Someone's just asked, what did the news test entail? Can you reveal oh, that? <laughs> yeah, the news, <laughs> so it was out of 10 and I actually got four. Um, so I don't actually know how I'm here. <laughs> but <laughs> um, So I remember the first question was, what's Meghan Markle's title? I got that one. And then the other one was, who's the manager of Liverpool FC? Now, I had no idea. So I said um, Jose, Jose Mourinho or something, which was completely wrong. Um, and then it was, I can't remember all the rest of the questions, but I think it was like, they, it wasn't too hard. It was like, who's the prime minister and stuff like that. And I, yeah, I got four out of 10 on that. I literally remember. So that was another thing. We found out our results on the day of that test. So that was another thing that said to me, okay, I definitely haven't got this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I can, you know, I, the way those sort of centres are, are organised, there's, you know, you mentioned the group assessment, you mentioned the news test, there was the interview. There's the different elements. And, um, you know, some people are, are really good at one one piece and less good at another so they're yeah. kind of taken together so if you feel you didn't do so well in one area it's it's probably not to worry about it's there's, it's a whole collection of different things to look at yeah. good well thank you so much Levi Levi it's really exciting to hear that a couple of people have commented that they too um didn't have a, the idea of apprenticeship sold to them at college so it's really interesting to hear from two people who have been on fantastic apprenticeship schemes and and have you know gone far as, as a result so it's really inspiring to hear thank you very much um okay i'm going to move on to on Cthulhu. hello how are you Hi. i'm good how are you <laughs> good so you were on the uk tv all voices scheme which was through film london but what were you doing before that so for me, um, like some other panelists mentioned, I did not have any clue what I wanted to do during secondary school. I went from wanting to be a teacher to uh, wanting to do um, be a doctor or um, like basically any different thing that was thrown up with me. I kind of was like, I want to do that. I'm kind of curious in that. And then I don't, uh, then I, um, during my sixth form, um, when I had to pick what I wanted to do during university, I studied computer science at City University of London. And that was the route that I really wanted to go down. Um, and then I did a placement year at the farm, um, no, at Informa, study, um, the role was information technology, analyst management kind of role, but it was like a placement, um, one year placement at the, at the industry. Um, so then um, when I did that, um, I realised quickly during that year that that wasn't the career for me. Um, and I remember going, oh, I need to go back to university and what I'm going to do in my life. Um, so then um, I spoke with my sister and people around me going, I don't know what to do. Um, they were like, oh, you because I did a media studies um, during GCSE. That, um, they said, oh, why don't you go into that? Um, I decided actually I have nothing to do else. Let me try and figure it out. So I did one week placement at the farm group, which is a post-production company. Um, and I, I wanted to get confidence whether this is this is where I should go or maybe I shouldn't. Um, discovered actually this is really good. Um, and actually I'm quite good at it. 
So um, that's what when did I decided. You do, what did you do on that work placement? So I kind of did different things. So um, I was, I sat down in like editorials. Um, so that would be in the editing room, um, the audio room. I also um, was a runner also. So I kind of got that experience in then. Um, and then, yeah, and then I was sitting in the library, so I was kind of understanding how they would use the, the system of breaking down the videos and how they stored it and things like that. So I was getting a, the full detail and full structure of post-production during that, during that one week. Then um, once I graduated, I was like, that's it. Um, I'm going to apply to Film London Eco Access Network. Um, and actually, surprisingly, I didn't realize that that scheme was such a great scheme. So all you need to do is basically sign up to a newsletter um, and then you get jobs. You get jobs of different kind of like places. So um, for me, my first job was working on Chernobyl, which was for HBO and Sky. And um, that literally got the ball rolling and that was from Equal Access Network. And then um, finished my work placement. So I was a production runner on that, on that job role. And it was the best experience ever. I was still in contact with um, Film London. They will send me um, through their newsletter and even um, directly through them, they will send me um, different schemes and things like that, which then I got involved with, which was a tie between Equal Access Network and the UK TV All Voices scheme. And um, then I got on to Dad's Army, which was basically part of the UK branch screen. So for UK TV, they have a lot of channels under them. So they've got Gold, they've got W, Day, Drama, um, Yesterday. They've got so many channels underneath them. So I, when they put me part of their scheme, I thought it was fantastic because it meant I could work with so many different channels um, and really discover what I truly wanted to do. Because the one thing is, I went from a degree going, and I did a placement going, actually, this is not it. And I didn't want to commit myself to a role, which I go, actually, later on, this is not what I want to do. So for me, as a runner, it was like the best place to put myself because I was like, actually, I can look at the different departments and go, um, art department, not for me. You know, the maybe the production department, maybe not for me, or the camera department. So I was able to knock them down. So what, what did you get from the All Voices scheme? What did they offer you as part of that? So um, with the All Voices scheme, they allow you to do it yourself and also, but also speak for them. So um, for me, they were like, for example, if you need help with CVs, um, you just let them know. Oh, I don't know. I'd, um, I would like to improve my CV and things like that. So they, as a branch, will come all together with their, with their team and put a, um, a session on for their, um, for their, for the people who are part of, underneath their scheme. And um, we would all just, um, you know, learn from the best and go, oh, okay, get tips on there, what we should include, um, what's the best way of, um, I guess, putting yourself forward. Um, they also ran like a LinkedIn scheme, which I thought was brilliant, um, which is basically how to use LinkedIn and also um, how to get employment through through the social, social channel and also keep them connect, connected to them. So if I, for me also, um, were also important for me also at that time, because it was a new scheme, um, like people who joined like um, all, um, the All Voices program, they will actually have been, you know, be involved in a lot much more. So they will get more out of it than I did at the time, even though I did get a lot, I, I got so much, but they'll get even more, which is they will like get mentorships, you know, um, like have someone who would actually help them, you know, speak with people and have a much tighter, um, tighter community. Um, but yeah, both Equal Access Network and All Voices. So it sounds like ha having been inspired to go into this industry through the work placement at the farm, it sounds like the Equal Access Network really opened your eyes to what was out there and to really explore the different sorts of jobs and, and companies. Absolutely. And it also helped me narrow down. Um, it took two years to help me figure out what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, so I was so lucky and fortunate to um, like build my own network. So that's the one thing I really like about Equal Access Network is... I had no idea what the jobs were until and I was got thrown in the deep end and I was like, yeah, I'm learning. So, um, and then also while you're on the job, you learn other people's jobs. Um, so you go, actually, I like this more better than what I thought I wanted to do. Um, so it's richly real world, <laughs> tucked in, and then you just, you know, you go running. Um, 
and yeah, so and it's actually paid gigs and um, paid jobs yeah. that you can get from Eco House Noah and all those. Uh, I, I know you you ended up being named by the Evening Standard as one of the capital's <laughs> brightest rising stars. How did that come about? That's amazing. Well, thank you. Um, I, I I was put forward from someone. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm actually trying to still find who put me forward, but um, basically I did like a lot of like runner gigs and things like that, and then um I started doing like. I was a production coordinator for Martin's Clothes for BBC Four, um, and they were like, "Yeah," and they were like, "Actually, yeah." Brilliant. And you now find yourself working on a, a major movie. I know you can't uh, tell us yeah. what it is, but that must be exciting stuff. Super exciting! <laughs> <laughs> Super exciting. What are you actually doing? What's your work consist of? Um. So actually, I worked on two movies. So one that I wrapped in. November and this other one that I'm currently working on so the other one was in the AD department because I thought that was what I wanted to do um, um so the j job role was kind of like in the tales of like a runner where you um you know uh, tell people that we're, we're recording you know be quiet um be, you know let basically letting the crew know what we're doing on set so this gig um that i'm currently doing is an assist so as a cast assistant so i work closely with one of the lead actress and i basically help her out for a day to day make sure she's good brilliant well we can't wait to find out what movie you've been working on when when it comes out so well done so uh thank you uh on kathoom so um thank you everyone that's really exciting to hear all your backgrounds and where you got to through these through these schemes um a couple of you mentioned having mentors i'd quite like to know a little bit about that toby you you, you had a mentor through your scheme what did that offer you yeah so i am now uh part of Media Trust Screen Skills Mentoring Programme. So I, I think, I can't remember the number, I think there's 60 people involved. But it, anyway, there's a lot of people involved and you're paired with a mentor from the industry with loads of experience. Um, obviously you tell Media Trust loads about yourself. If you're lucky enough to get picked for the scheme, they have loads of information about you, what you want to do with, with your career and then they match you with someone with a lot of experience who they think is best suited for you. And then because we're living in a world of Zoom at the moment, um, you meet with them once a month on Zoom and, and you help each other. Well, in, in my case, it's more they're helping me because I, I don't feel like I've got much to give to the mentor. But, um, uh, but it's brilliant. Yeah, so, so like one day, one day I'd love to, to make documentaries. Um, so that's what I said I wanted to do. And that's what they're helping me. They're teaching me how to make treatments and, and just telling me more about the industry. Um, it's brilliant. And it's, it's, again, it's just connections. And it's, an, it's, it's just another thing that's come my way that I've just said yes to straight away because you never know where it's going to lead. And, it, and again, it's been brilliant. I think all of you said that you didn't have any contacts or, or networks in this industry before you went onto the scheme. So, Lauren, how did you develop and, and start to nurture those networks? Um, yeah, so I didn't have any contacts at all in TV before I um, joined uh, the Mummy Youth Project. So um, that's been a really key thing for me the whole time throughout the whole like past year and a half. Um, everybody I meet or um, even just random emails, you never know who's going to email you. And something that I think is really handy is people's email signatures. Um, often they tell you not only their name, obviously, but what they do. It gives you um, quite often their phone number, their email address, where their office is based. And a big thing for me is organisation. So I have a spreadsheet, um, which is all password protected, GDPR. Um, and uh, I quite often save people's details. So if it's somebody that I've had an exchange with in any capacity, um, I will save their details on there with a little note. I have a notes column which says what the interaction was about, how I met them, what show I was on at the time. Um, and I save that. So I've got a log of contacts, people um, that I've met or that I've had to work with um, or ask questions. And it's really handy if ever a problem comes up, I can look at my spreadsheet and say, okay, this person from business affairs was really helpful on this occasion. Maybe I can email them to try and find something out. Um, and not only is that helpful for day-to-day -day work, it's also really helpful when you're looking for work as well. Um, 
because you never know, as Toby has said, you know, you never know when someone's going to pop up again. And this is actually a very small industry. So people do pop up time and time again. Well, that's some serious networking tips. <laughs> good. <laughs> I got a lovely comment here. It says, uh, hi, guys, just wanted to say you are amazing. I'm having such an adrenaline rush hearing your stories. That's lovely to hear. Um, OK, I'm going to open up to some questions um, from our audience. Uh, Kieran says, what would you encourage I do to stand out in these processes and perhaps be successful this time round? Uh, who would like to go with that? Levi, what what? How do you think, uh, what do you think Kieran should do to stand out? Um, I always say, I just think you should unapo- unapologetically be yourself. I think if you overthink it, um, that's when it will not work out how you want it to be. So with me, as I said, like I knew that I didn't have a lot of experience. I knew I didn't, I wasn't clued up on, you know, things like politics and stuff before I joined you know so I just made sure that I so instead of selling myself with all my experience that I didn't have I just sold myself and my natural personality instead and yeah I would just say be yourself um to stand out literally Thank you. Uh, one for Nikki um from Shona Elliott she says one thing I've noticed about friendships is they can be paid quite a low wage after finishing the scheme and work, now working in the industry, do you find your salary progression has been good? Um, yeah, 100%. As soon, um, when you're doing an apprenticeship, you literally build up your CV, and when you start applying for jobs, they ask you your rate, and you can push, not too high, but it can push higher, so I tend to push just a little bit, and um, yeah, so literally the more experience you have, the higher your rate goes, so it's definitely increased since my apprenticeship, which is really nice. Um, Ricky says, bar the schemes, what else do you think people should do, especially in these times, to gain experience? Um, on Kathum, what, what do you think people could do to, to get experience, especially given the difficult circumstances we all find ourselves in right now? I would just say, let's just sign up. So if you know where you want to, as in the department you want to work in or not, if you don't have that, I'll say start as a runner. And that's like the best thing. That's not like what I've done. Um, and you would literally have so much contact there's there's so many there's so many crew um that you can go in well basically when you're working as a runner you interact with so many departments even though it's covid and things like that obviously the restrictions going to be there but you can still engage you still would you know stand two meters you both have your mask on and things like that so that wouldn't be an issue regardless in covid time i would add when we're recruiting apprentices at the bbc you know obviously we're we're interviewing people that don't have um, very much experience in most cases or indeed no, no experience but what we're looking for is passion and something to show that interest so making your own stuff you know writing blogs as a couple of you guys have, have done um, making your own films and putting them on YouTube making content starting to write starting to um, experiment with your own abilities is is really useful and gives you fantastic stuff to talk about in application forms you know maybe you've written to local media you've created your own blog maybe you've been involved in a charity website something like that there's lots of stuff you could be making and and um, getting on with uh okay question here would you recommend a gap year to research and build up a portfolio work on your passion so who had the gap year experience i did a bit of gap year yeah yeah i definitely say when you have your gap year use that time wisely and just create create content whatever you want to do just create content and you'll never know when it'll come in handy again so that whole year I took time out had a part-time job and when I was at home I was doing blogging photography writing and my friends by myself just building up my own portfolio and researching shows that you like production companies researching different avenues that's a perfect time to look at schemes when they open for the next year so my plan was to build up my skills one year then the next year start applying uh question from sarah tilly um what really makes you stand out on an application or on your cv uh toby um s- piggybacking on what you said a minute ago um don't be afraid to shout about what you're doing in your own time i mean um i i go into schools and give addiction talks i write my blog these are all things that go onto my applications because they they show that you've that you've got another side to you and you've got a story and 
and depending on what it is, it can show lots of things. Like in my case, I think it shows a bit of empathy. Um, so just don't be don't be scared to put on your. Make sure you have a section on applications where you where you tell them what you do in your free time, as long as it's productive, obviously. <laughs> did you did you have the that the sort of level of confidence to go and speak about that at, at schools, or, or or was it the other way around? Did your confidence develop as a result of doing it? I think, to be honest, because it's going to sound cheesy, but like I've. I've nearly killed myself, not not actually, but like through through drinking, I've I've nearly lost my life, and I think I just don't like I've got nothing to lose, and it's something I'm passionate about. I don't think it came through working in TV. I think it's just something I'm passionate about, and I can talk about it easily because it was my life for so many years. Mm. So it's quite easy to talk to, and I've got a lot to say <laughs> about the subject. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it's made me who I am, so it is what it is. One for Levi. Uh, if my experience is primarily writing, can I still make it in broadcast? Um, I think definitely, yeah. Um, so it's such a wide it's such a wide industry. So, for example, the team that I work on, Newsbeat, it's a radio programme, um, yeah, broadcast to the Radio 1 and 1 Extra audience but they have an online section. So what I do day to day is writing articles, even though I didn't have any previous training in that. So I would say, yeah, definitely. Anonymous question here. What is a better use of time applying to schemes such as the ones that we've been talking about or emailing people individually to try and get work experience? Both. Yeah. Do it all. You got to do everything. Just, just yeah. plan on everything apply for everything email people and I, I saw in one of the questions someone asked um I did did a year's placement and a, a week's placement and then I emailed them afterwards to ask what's next shall I email them again yeah <laughs> keep emailing them just keep emailing them until they block you or give you another job that's my advice anyway um someone says here uh I've got contacts from over five years ago when I was 13, I, I did a scheme. I'm now approaching 22. Would it be appropriate to email them now and, uh, and ask about potential jobs and opportunities? Yeah, I think any way in is a good way in. I mean, I stay in touch with talent managers by emailing them. If it's something like Happy New Year, I'll say Happy New Year is the subject line. And then I'll say, hey, I know it's been a while since we've spoken. I just want to say thank you for everything you did for me last year. Um, I'd love to have a catch up at some point soon. All the best for the new year. Any reason to email somebody is a good reason. Yeah. So, Lauren, you've mentioned talent managers a, a couple of times. Do you want to just um, explain what talent managers do for, for people that might not know? They are God's gift to the television industry, <laughs> honestly. I So um, at the BBC, a lot of my experience is BBC, so I can only kind of speak about the BBC, but there are dedicated teams and Mama Youth actually is unique in that they have their own in-house uh, talent manager, the wonderful tours, um, and talent managers uh, primarily focus on um, getting talent into roles. So um, a big push at the moment within the BBC is getting diverse talent into job roles. Um, and that's kind of their sole focus. So they will reach out to people that they've heard about on the grapevine or people that they've kind of discovered themselves, speak to them, see what they want to do, see if there are any roles available for them. Um, and that's their kind of full-time full -time job. So I owe a lot to, to talent managers. <laughs> Uh, Violaine is asking for the best tips on networking. She says, um, I always feel really awkward talking to people about professional opportunities. I never know how to ask the personal details to be able to contact them in the future. So um, on, on Kathleen, how, how, do you, how do you tackle that? It can be a bit awkward, can't it? Um, to be honest, you don't need to do the talking. You could be the listener. So you can literally ask them the question of, you know, what do you do and let them talk um that's what I usually do I, I, I like to hear what people have to say and then um sometimes they will I'll be like oh well, tell me about what you're doing um you know are there jobs in your production company you know you could just do that and get your information from them and go um I'd love to keep in contact as simple as that you don't need to go overboard and overthink just let them do the talking if you're feeling the pressure Emily says, uh, what general sort of questions do they ask in the interview stages, uh, Levi? 
Um, so my video interview was um, what do you think you could bring to the scheme? Um, and you had to answer it in 30 seconds. Um, other than that, I, on, my, on my face to face interview in the assessment center, um, it was questions about just myself, um, what I know about the industry. And also one thing, um, especially for like anyone who's interested in journalism is um, bringing an idea with you. Uh, so for all of the stages of the interview, they asked us to pitch an idea. So ours was on, um, they said to us, it's, it's the 70th anniversary of the NHS. What, how would you cover this? And then, yeah, I remember my story was um, linking it to the 70th anniversary of the Windrush and um, black nurses contribution in the NHS. So I would say, yeah, or it's usually stuff about ideas and what you could bring different to the role. That's what I've mainly seen. Question from Grace. What kind of things should you do to build up a portfolio? I think that's along the lines we were talking about before. And the sort of things that most of you were doing, writing blogs, making your own films, putting things on YouTube. Any other suggestions? Well, we've mentioned it before as well, but work experience. As much work experience as you can do. In as many, well, it might, if it's journalism, in as many newsrooms as you can do, as you can get to. Um, on, t on top of that, yeah, story ideas like Levi said, if it's journalism, as many story ideas as you can take with you when you do that work experience. Um, this question is focused to Lauren, Mickey and on Kathum. When you completed these schemes and courses, did they suggest you need to narrow down with a specific role or area you wanted to work in? I ask this because at university they're asking this of us and honestly, I'm happy to work in any area. If you narrow down the role in which you want to work, is it narrowing your options? What do you think? Let's start with Lauren. It's, it's a tricky one. I think there is a tendency in this industry because so many people are so focused on progressing quickly that they lose sight of the value in the positions that are entry level, like being a runner, for example. For me, that's the best job on a production because you get to take the teas and coffees into the room full of execs that other people who are slightly higher up can't go into. Um, so I think make the most of being in these entry level positions. And um, as Anka Thum has been saying, you know, have a scope out the other departments, talk to people, see what they do, see if you think it might be for you. Um, and it's okay to say, actually, you know what, I don't think I'd enjoy that. Um, one thing I would say as well is, you know, once you kind of have a, a, an inkling of what you might like to try and progress with, do focus on it because you don't want to appear unfocused to anybody who you might be um, coming to an interview with. So, you know, have a couple of options in your head, do your research and um, make sure you understand the career progression for various departments. Um, but yeah, don't, don't pigeonhole yourself too early. Um, I was going to say for me, I've literally done all the roles that so I've done. I've been like a script supervisor. I've done like, I worked in the camera department, art department, um, in short films, when we have like smaller teams, I've been like helped out in like the makeup department. I've done like all the roles. Um, for me, simply, it was just because I want to understand an in-depth knowledge of how the other departments work and how I would communicate, how I would communicate better with them. Um, that's why, for me personally, you need to have different type of CV for each department. You need to. That's what for me the best tip is to go when you're submitting your CV for a particular job role have all those job roles in that format. So it would be all the camera kind of jobs that I've done in that, and I'll send it for that particular role and job. And for me, current still, I still, I get jobs from like different departments at the same, you know, today, if someone would like something, but they're at different departments. And obviously they know that I'm at a different stage than I was then. Um, so I'll go, no, absolutely go ahead. If you want to work in different uh, departments, you know, make sure, but it's making sure that you know where you want to go so if you want to eventually change your mind and you want to work in the art department then I you can narrow it down and go actually I don't want to all do this I'm now focusing on this and then you just speak to those people that I'm actually working at well look we're drawing towards the the end of the conversation and it's been 
really useful. I hope everyone's enjoyed it and picked up some really top tips here. It seems to me that, uh, well, I, I know this because it's my job and I love it, that schemes are a fantastic way into this industry. Um, it's been really interesting. Several of you had, you know, very different starts, you know, um, Kathleen, you mentioned computer science and Toby, you know, economics and business. So very different backgrounds before you, you found your passion through coming on to these schemes. Um, what would you say to people considering applying for a scheme like the one that got you into the industry, uh, Toby? Just go for it. Honestly, go for it. Like, the more you apply for, the more chance you've got of get, getting onto one. Um, you've got nothing to lose. And if you do get onto one, make the most of it. Really make the most of it. Make sure that you get the contact details of everyone that you meet and ask everyone that you meet, what do I need to do? What do I need to do next to get to come back? What do I need to do to make this my paid job? And if you make a good impression, they'll help you. Well, most, well, everyone that I've met has been very helpful to me. So just make the most of it and don't turn down any opportunities. If you it, it's, uh, do as many op opportunities as you possibly can. I know it's not possible to do everything, but everything you possibly can do. Lauren, your top tip. Oh, my top tip would be to get organised. If you're applying for a scheme, take the time. The applications are quite lengthy um, and they do use them to kind of filter through people. So take, honestly, this, these lights keep turning off and it turns me into a ghost. Um, take the time to personalise your application. Look into the company or the scheme you're applying for. Um, Look on places like LinkedIn, see if you can find any alumni of these schemes, talk to them about their experience um, and think about what those schemes might be looking for. And also recognise the value in your own life experience and your own contributions. You have valuable things to give to these schemes as well as what they can give you. So don't forget that. And hopefully that should help with some of the nervousness. Nikki. Keep applying. And the thing is, even if you don't get it, the more you apply, the more you understand how to do the application. So I used to do, I used to save my instructions, save the paragraphs and reword it and keep rewriting it. And the more you save the work, the more you save the applications, it becomes so much more easier to apply for more um, schemes. And it's honestly, just keep applying. Over to you, Levi. Um, as I said before, I would say be you. And I would also say... Um, Never feel like you um, don't fit in somewhere. Occupy every space that you can. Um, yeah, like I said before, with journalism, 94% of journalists are white. Never feel like if you're not, that you can't occupy those spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah, be, be you. That's what um, the broadcasters are looking for on these things. They want you to be your, your creative self. Uh, um, Kathleen, what's your top tip? Um, I'll say... Don't get comfortable, you know, always challenge yourself. Um, so currently I'd say now would be, you know, sending emails to those people that you want to get, you know, production companies that you love. So kind of like seeing the shows that you like watching uh, and contact them. So that would be the first thing you would do um, and keep emailing them, <laughs> um, you know, and go out there to like these seminars that you're currently doing now. Um, and, you know, just reach out to people and get your first job. Top advice. Thank you so much, Toby, Lauren, Nikki, Levi and Om Kathum. I've loved chatting to you all and I hope everyone listening is feeling as inspired as I am. Uh, you've all been so kind to share your journeys. Thank you very much. These schemes universally gave you all a wonderful foot into the door. Um, helped you develop your contacts and understand the industry. But let's be clear, it was also your hard work and your ability that got you to where you are now. So huge congratulations and here's to your exciting futures ahead. For more information on all of the schemes mentioned, they are going to be posted in the chat and are also available on the Royal Television Society's website. And talking of the RTS, who are kindly hosting this two-day jam-packed careers fair, they run two bursary schemes, which you can also get involved in. The technology bursary and the TV production and journalism bursary. The schemes are designed to support people from lower income backgrounds to pursue a career in the television industry. 
scholars benefit from financial support, free RTS membership, networking events, industry mentorship for the TV production students and the summer tour for technology students. Details of these can be found on the RTS website too. Thanks again to the panellists. Huge thanks to our event producer, Ali Laurie, who's a publicist with UK TV and BBC Studios Distribution and an RTS Futures Committee member. I'm Daniel Morrissey. Thank you for joining the session and have a good evening. Thank you. Good night.